Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. The countdown very much on now to the Welsh game on Saturday. There is much to discuss midway through uh, this prep week for the Irish side. We have Keith Wood with us. You're there, Keith? I am indeed. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Great to have you with us. And Matt Williams, you're there as well? I am Joe. How are you, Keith? Uh, I'm excellent, Matt. Good to hear your dulcet Aussie tones. <laughs> what a charm. <laughs> So, I'm sure people know the team at this stage. Jordan Larmer, Andrew Conway, Robbie Henshaw comes into the starting 15. Uh, Bundyaki keeps his place. Jacob Stockdale does similarly. And then we have Johnny Saxton and Connor Murray. We have a front row of Keane Healy, Rob Herring, Tyg Furlong. It is James Ryan and Ian Henderson once again. And then we have Peter O'Mahony, Josh van der Fleer and CJ Stander. The Welsh are coming to town, Keith. What did you make of Saturday gone? Um, I, I enjoyed it after a fashion. Um, I I would have liked to be a little bit more clinical, um, and I, I do you know what? For some reason, I didn't feel panicky watching it. I felt we were going to win it throughout. Um, I felt we tried things we could have tried more. Um, uh, but one of the one of the elements from this, and it comes across as a truly dreadful cliche, is you have to build up a level of momentum, and you want to get the win first thing first. Uh, Wales had an easy game against an incredibly lacklustre um, Italy and were able to wipe the floor with them. And uh, we weren't given that opportunity as much. I was a little bit disappointed in our level of aggression because I really think we need to get that level up an awful lot higher. I think we suffered for it last year. Um, I'd like to have been very, very happy, but we got a few injuries and I didn't get to see some of the guys that were, were, were gunning for a spot. So, look, overall, I was happy enough. I watched it from home. Um, we had a load of people in and around, a load of kids kind of watching it. They were excited by it as an idea. So I think we have to be careful sometimes not to get too cynical. Um, uh, I'd like to have seen more, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy we're off. We're, we're up and running. And um, I, I think that's the first game under the belt. Wales have had a couple of games because they played the Barbas beforehand. They can sort out a few things with a new coach. We'll see more, I hope, this weekend. Um, and I also think this weekend is much more of a challenge for us. And that's a good thing for Irish rugby. It's interesting you picked up the, on the aggression point because in advance of the game, Keith, Andy Farrell, when he was asked, even generally, just a general question, what can we expect from this Irish team? He talked about aggression, physicality, referenced the 07 game at Crow Park, you know, the hallmarks of Irish rugby in his, in his view. And so I fully expected, well, if nothing else, especially against uh, Scotland, who are not genetically superior to us, unlike other teams, that Ireland would be the aggressors here. Um, now, to what extent you can take a coach's public pre-match comments uh, at face value, I don't know. But uh, it was very notable that despite you know all the build-up from Farrell in that regard, and actually Scotland looked a bit more damaged and up for it after the World Cup. I, I think there's a bit of that too, but also it takes a bit of time. So to be fully aggressive you're looking for everybody knowing exactly what you're doing at any period of time. That's, I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but if I go up at a million miles an hour and you take your time, that doubt is incredibly destructive to mm. us. We always got knocked off our kilter very quickly. It just shows you what happens. So we're not, we're not absolutely buoyant with, um, uh, we're not absolutely buoyant with um, confidence either. You know, we got a bit of a, a hard time in the World Cup and it's been fairly negative since. So our confidence isn't fully up there yet. And that takes a little bit of time to do it. But also, actually, I thought when uh, when Keelan Doris got the bang in the head, th that takes a lot out of you. Mm. This is a young kid who's starting and um, it's, it's funny. I've been watching a, a thing on Amazon for the last couple of weeks with my boys on American football. These guys get paid lorry loads of money. You know, it's a huge thing, but they're all incredibly human in it. We kind of forget that at times. So, look, I, I'm not giving any excuses whatsoever. I, I still have, um, if we forget the level of aggression for a minute, uh, what I always wish for when I look at an Irish team is that they have an incredibly hard push defence because it's where we're at our most comfortable and I think at our most confident. Uh, Matt, a point uh, you have been making on Twitter and you've been uh, quoting your colleague Brett Ego, that's how I pronounce it, isn't it? Brett Igo. 
Igo, excuse me, who's been a coach down the years and around the game for a long time. And so he's been looking at the end on end view of things. And, you know, we, we often hear about attacking shape. And Pat Lamb famously had this 2 4 2 shape. And Brett has looked at Ireland and it seems like the look of the 1 3 3 2 shape. Now, without pictures, we can't get into too much uh, depth here, clearly. But the question is one, do you like the look of that shape? Do you like, in theory, what that shape is trying to do? And how does it fit in with the players we have at our disposal? It fits in very well. Um, I do like the look of the shape. Um, and Ireland tried it a number of times. I, I, I think that there's, a, there's a difficulty with this, that, it, that around the world everyone's copying each other without really thinking about it. There's, if these, these shapes came out of New Zealand... Um, but the New Zealanders and to the, the Australians, to a lesser degree, um, play two out halves in their team. That's why they moved Bowden Barrett to fullback and put Rishi Munga to put him into the team as a starting ten, because you need really good passes to shift that ball fast enough and accurately enough against a rushing defence. Um, when Australia beat New Zealand in the only highlight of the Australian season last year. <laughs> it was a good highlight, but it was the only one. They, they, uh, they played two. They, they brought uh, Curtly Burl and played him at 15. And, and they, this, this ability and the quality of the passing allows you to get around the defence. Now, I just don't... You know, I'm, I'm, I like Bundiak. I'm a big fan of him. I, I don't think we use him the right way, but I also don't think he, he's a great second 5'8", as the New Zealand would say, not like a, a, a fine, skilled player. I think he's a really good footballer. I'm not questioning him in any way but that's not his game and I think at times they struggled in that shape because of that they did there was one occasion where um Gary Ringrose did make some very good ground on the, in the first half on, on the far side of the field and the right hand side of the field as, as Ireland were running but there were a lot of other times where the, where the Scottish defence was getting up and belting us midfield and we couldn't get that ball into the channel so look I, I think it's a bit like Keith just suggested well, I'm prepared to give him a bit of time but mm. I also think that this is a big problem in coaching across the world where we're, we're putting in systems without looking at the athletes we have. And, you know, do, do the athletes have to increase their level of, of skill? Of course they do. But the, I don't think they'll get that time this week against Wales as well. Wales have a very, very well-organised D from, from the time when, when uh, uh, you know, from Warren Gatlin's time, the hangover there from Sean Edwards. It's, it, it was very solid the other day. Now, we know it was only Italy and they didn't test them. But they've still got some things to do. The things I didn't like, mate, we didn't see a counter-attack. Jordan Lama ran back, but I thought our wingers were lazy and they didn't get back and support him so we could com could combine in. There was a fair few things there. But, um, you know, uh, is there time? Yes, there is. But it'll have to be quick because this is a very good world mm. side. And you know, they're coming here with no fears. They're going to have to really up their game right across all aspects of, of their uh, performance. And just to, to pick up on the point you make there, so, you, you, you know, we, we have that picture, say the ball going to Larmer and the Irish, uh, the two Irish wings are high up in the defensive line. You, you kind of want them to double back and come around and get in touch with Larmer when he has the ball, is it? Yeah, well, well you know, Alan Gaffney, when we used to run counter-attack drills, um, you know, he, he would just say, listen, guys, it's just hard work. It's just effort. Realignment is just you've got to bust your backside. You've got to sprint back. You can't just jog back. You've got to sprint back. So we saw Lama run the ball back a number of times. And that's not counterattack. That's running the ball back. You know, mm -hmm. where's the support around, around, those, around him to pass to? And, and you have to blame the centres as well. The centres have got to, the, the wide centre has to push back in in the old systems to, to, to create that, which you see in New Zealand. Mm. So in, the, in New Zealand, when you see the ball go uh, to a fullback or just into touch when they do a quick, a quick throw in, you'll see four guys across the field. And before you can, you can uh, count the five, that ball has been transferred to the far side of the field away from the chasing defence. Now, it doesn't matter who you've got a fullback unless you've got Superman there in a cape and he can fly over the top of them. If you've only got one guy in the back and he catches the ball and runs up, the chances of him getting through are slim in, at the elite levels of international rugby. So we need to sort of put some more structures around, okay. around Lam. And I think Lam is a fabulously exciting uh, young man. He's playing really good rugby at the moment. But he, 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 and, and what that also creates is slow ball. If you just got one guy running back a slow ball, you know, and Connor Murray box kicking, God save me, I'm so sick of it. It's boring, it's laborious, 
it's, and it's not just Connor, I know it's in other twos, but, but if you don't get fast ball, what do they do? They box kick it. We've got to find a way to get faster, faster ball. And, and if you, you just run back into defenders, you've got three defenders on you, that's going to be slow ball. So it, all those things are related in the, in the system. Mm. Um, but I, I have to say, I, I, I was really... And I didn't think Connor kicked well at all. And it was, it was exceptionally slow. I'm aware what Keith's saying. We can get a bit... The grumpy old men can get a bit, <laughs> a bit grumpy, but it, 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 it is getting well, very tedious right across the game, the box kicking. Well, if, 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 I, if I jump on that a little bit, and I would agree with a lot of that, and in fairness to Alan Gaffney, who was, uh, was and still is one of the most cynical men I, I, <laughs> I've ever met in my life. He's a truly... Uh, and he's right up my street. He's magnificent, right? Uh, really good. But... Like we, and again, this is kind of like old school stuff, but we were taught that if you catch the ball at the back, and for some strange reason, I often caught the ball at the back, you look to pass. Because once you pass it once, you are then able to look up and see and support. Whereas if you run back straight, you're trying to gauge everything in real time yourself, you're, you're, and you're in control of the ball as well. So there's normally one or two passes, and then you have a shape, and then you can attack. And the reason why I'd like Larmer to do that is because I think he's fast, but where he's ludicrously dangerous is on a step. And if he can pick a line off somebody, it, it's I just think he can be incredibly destructive all the time. And look, I, I go back. I, the box kiss, kicks are losing their effectiveness. Uh, you're criticizing some of the kicks. A couple of them weren't great, but most of them are actually okay. But in the last year... It has now become absolutely part and parcel of a referee's interpretation that guys who are running interference, unless they knock a guy out of the way, is absolutely fine. Twelve months ago, you had a straight run to go for um, uh, to compete in the air with somebody with nobody in your way. If they were in your way, it was considered a penalty. Though it's not considered a penalty anymore, and I think it's actually better for the game because we're not having as many. Um, uh, big collisions in the air with two people going for the ball. So it's almost an ignoring of a law of the game has made it a little bit safer, but it's also kind of taken away the benefit mm. of box kicking with a view of getting it back. Uh, the next point I want to bring up is arguably less of a question and more just interesting information. But I want to I put it to you both anyway and see if you have any uh, points to make on it, because we are still in the early stages of the Farrell era and people are curious about the methodology. How are they going about their business? You know, so they're at the uh, National Sports Campus in Abbottstown. So uh, instead of, as, as Roy O'Connor wrote today in the Irish Independent, they're not in that stuffy, darkened room in Carton House. This is the Monday morning review I'm talking about. So what they're able to do now, which it, in fairness does sound pretty dynamic and interesting, is they have an indoor pitch, an indoor facility at the national campus at Abbottstown. So they have a video room right next to it. They sit in the video room, they go through bits and pieces, and then they're able to go straight out onto the indoor pitch, rectify the mistake or what they've identified, go back in again, another piece of footage, uh, rinse, wash and repeat, which sounds, you know, kind of a, an interesting thing. And what Farrell said was it was about empowering players. We're trying to make it inclusive, get proper feedback, get them talking. They're the guys who are out in the field. We're up in the stands. Uh, you know, it, it was a great morning on Monday. Our guys are rugby players. They don't want to be sat in a classroom the whole time. Now, I don't think that was meant as a biting critique of Joe Schmidt, but certainly, you know, you would associate Joe with the classroom on the Monday morning. What did seem like more of a, a, a critique of Schmidt came, Keith, from Ian Henderson. He said, there is a different mentality around the place. There's a different mentality in meetings. There's a different relationship between players and coaches. He said, everything that's done is done in a positive manner. Maybe in years gone by, guys might be a wee bit tentative of who they ask questions to or who they were trying to get clarity from for fear of people thinking they don't know their detail, they don't know their stuff. But now there's a very open learning system. And I would say that's been put in place to ensure guys are free to get information whenever they want. So there are two kind of interesting things coming out from the camp. I mean, as ever, the proof will be in the pudding. You know, Joe Schmidt did very well his way, but it, that, we're getting an insight into how they're doing things. Well, I also think these guys are becoming more mature, and um, it's funny. I, we tried to touch on this a few weeks ago. Maybe we didn't delve into it as quickly or as much as we, as we should have. Um, when you have a coach, you do what the coach says. Mm. The, the coach is the boss. Now, if, the, if, if it works, that's fantastic. All you want to do is win. Right. So if you're winning, you're not really arguing through an awful lot of the detail. Um, 
But without a shadow of a doubt, a lot of pressure came on over the last 12 months from Ireland reaching the top of the zenith of the game um, to beating New Zealand again, to, to doing incredibly well, winning a Grand Slam, to then getting bullied for maybe four or five matches in the last year to a huge amount of time together that seemed to be fatiguing, not um, uh, energising. Um, guys are going to look for a change, but also you've guys that have been told what to do for a long period of time. These are strong, intelligent, capable guys. They will often want to have an input as well. And in many respects, I think it's 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 just a change in coach and a change in coaching style. And we've all had it at different times. So, I, look, I said it, I think it was last week, I had conversations with with you know some of the greats that we've had in the last few years, and they're saying, what are we going to do after Joe's gone? But there's always another coach, and the other coach isn't going to do it in the same way because that's almost too tiring. So they're going to do it in a different way. Mm. So uh, Andy Farrell is... I think we're lucky to have Andy Farrell because Andy Farrell is a very particular beast. This guy is um, an accomplished sportsman, an incredibly driven man. Mm. Um, but a guy with a bit of a wicked sense of humor and also a guy who understands that really you have to enjoy it. It can't be about pressure every minute of every day. And um, I'd love to have had the opportunity to play under Joe Schmidt, but I might have only loved to have done it for a couple of years, <laughs> you know, and uh, maybe it's the case because you want, I don't want to be under pressure every minute of every day. Yeah. And um, uh, in fact, what I used to try and do when big pressure matches came on, I would become more silly as the week went on and the times where I could. I was very serious on the training field, dangerously serious at times, and fully focused at that period of time and hopefully fully focused on the match on the Saturday. But I was forever trying to relax more often. And I had got towards the end of my career when things had become far more serious. There's too many bloody meetings for me, mm. you know, so... You know, it's it takes all types. And um, we used to say there were independent views all the time when we started because the game was amateur. And then it became all rugby views and rugby players' views. Now you're getting a different perspective from a, a sportsman who's been involved in professional sport for longer than anybody, pretty much. And um, because he was playing rugby league before rugby union was professional. So we're getting a different perspective to it. Um so, I, look, I don't know. Everything that's going to be said at the moment is a criticism on Joe Schmidt. Joe Schmidt deserves some criticism because we didn't do as well as we'd all hoped that we were going to do. Uh, I'd still say let not that sully what happened before 2019. Yeah. So, uh, Matt, I don't know what you can take from a 42 points to nil win over Italy. Certainly Ireland laboured in Rome last year, so it's not like it's a, you know, a foregone conclusion that you'll beat them by 42 points to nil. But uh, what kind of shape do Wales come here in, do you think? And uh, how's this game going to go on Saturday? Well, you've got to give any team at international level fair credit when they score 42 points. And the Italians were surprisingly... Uh, poor. They they seem to have gone backwards, which is pretty hard to say because they were in a very low place before the tournament. Um, the defence from the line-out, so in other words, a set-piece defence, which should be the, the best place to defend because you've got time, you can look, look at what they do and you get organised. The Italians' set-piece defence from outside centre-out was absolutely remarkably poor. I, I, I was quite shocked when I was watching it, because I, I actually, we actually, I was with you, Joe, and we we're in the TV, and we are, I asked them, what's your replay? I said, well, who's he taking? So the, 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 the Italian winger literally stood in the only spot where there was no one, and they just ran straight through. Uh, so, now, to be fair to the Welsh, their passing seems to have improved. It was high-quality passing. It was rapid, it was flat, and it was very well-directed, and it got the ball... Um, to the extremities really, really quickly. And, and I, I can see a change from the old uh, style that Warren Gatlin used to play, but it's still got the same discipline. Now, where Wales are in all of that, we don't really know because the, the Italians were just that poor. Mm. Um, so I, I, I do think that they'll come to the Aviva with very little fear. 
they'll come with a lot of confidence. And if Ireland defend the way they did, just as, as Keith was pointing out, Ireland are at their best when that D comes off the line and they're aggressive and they're fast and they're in your face and they're... they're that's when Ireland are a really difficult team to break down. But I didn't think they were that difficult to break down the other day. I thought we were very slow off the line and the Scots were having a lot of joy um, and because they played a lot more direct than, than they usually do. We usually expect them just to go side to side to side. But they did play direct and it did cause us troubles. So, you know, I think if Wales played to their potential, if Ireland don't have a significant improvement in their performance... Uh, that they could be in real trouble, you know. And, I, and again, I, I agree with what he said. It is the beauty of the Six Nations. There's so much we don't know about most of the teams. Mm. Well, well, the unknown is more than the known. Uh, and probably even more with England now. We thought we knew a bit, fair bit about them after their performance. But we just don't know an, enough about Ireland or about Wales. And we expect both teams to improve. Mm. Uh, having said all that, Playing at home, that's a big, big plus. You know, they only look Ireland only lost once in five years, so that's being at the Aviva is is a huge bonus for uh, for the national team. Yeah, well, it's going to be compelling view in one way or another. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in, and I am also uh, delighted to announce Richard Cooper is going to be back in the fold for the Six Nations for another blast of Richard's rugger thing. The first episode goes live tomorrow, and we've heard rumours that Will Greenwood and Scott Quinnell will be making appearances. And Matt and Keith, I will alert you when you're featuring, don't worry. Yep, so, very happy to be out of that one. <laughs> so, uh, well, France, England, goodness me, Keith. I think we were, we were all kind of hoping last week, weren't we, that we'd get this kind of France for the tournament, for everything, and, geez, that first 40 was fun. I'm hoping that for 15 years. And um, I, I look, I loved it because it was a joy to watch. Um, and look, it's a joy on many levels because it's no harm for England to lose and, and no harm for England to lose after the bullshitty comments of, um, of Eddie Jones talking. Do you think, do you think they were a factor? Do you think they were a factor? I, I actually, I always think that things like that are a factor because they're a factor for the opposition who stick it up on the wall. And you, look, people say they don't need it. Well, don't say it so because you have it. But also it's a... Um, the level of brutality that he was talking about, like what sort of pressure is that on his players? He wants to have great players, the, you know, and he t started talking about it when when the player that he relies upon wasn't playing, mm. Vinny Van Apola. Mm. And England are a very different team without Van Apola in the side. I thought his selection was poor, pitting, um, picking Curry at, at, at eight. Um, uh, and I thought he got schooled in the match. Um, I just thought some of the athleticism of the French players were, were phenomenal. I think Dupont's a pleasure to watch to play. He's just able to orchestrate whatever it is that he wants to do. Um, I thought it brought back a level of small rugby players. And I think that that is fantastic. A lot of the backs are not big men. Um, what surprised me on the weekend, two things that surprised me, was the speed and acceleration of Tompkins for Wales and some of the speed that went around the French back row forwards mm. and that athleticism, I thought it was phenomenal. And it was, I have to equally say, Johnny May scoring two unbelievably magic tries was the, like, and you can't rely on that all the time. He plucked both of those out of pretty much nowhere. Um, otherwise, England would have been absolutely roundly beaten out the gate. And it was, but it was an amazing to see that style of rugby back in again. And uh, we don't know how long it'll last. I want it to last as long as possible. And I still want us to try and beat them at the end of it. But I think rugby is better for having um, a style and a play and something like that in. And Sean Edwards, uh, you know, wherever he has been, he's another rugby league guy, but in at everything he's ever done, he has held silverware at the end of it. He is a guy that is, and I mentioned to you before, I met him at a coffee shop in the scrummery in Twickenham about 15 years ago when I was still playing. And he, he grilled me for an hour. He said, listen, any chance I can talk to you? I want to talk to you. What do you think about defence? And he grilled me solidly for an hour. I swear to God, I've never been, it was like an interview, but wow. it was like an, interrog like an interrogation. I met him the following day and he blanked me totally. <laughs> he got what he wanted the day before. <laughs> you know, that's, and he is obsessed. I, I didn't think anything less of him. This, he wanted the information. He didn't need to talk to me the following day. That was in the past for him. He was, he's obsessed with with thinking of anything that's slightly different of trying to get it. 
apparently he has got to the level of French that he needs to not have any interpreter anywhere near him. Now, he never speaks an awful lot in English, but he doesn't speak an awful lot in French. But what he says is direct and to the point. And he has given them a sense of security that they haven't had for a period of time. Well, that's very impressive because even Raj was in here on Monday and even, you know, he would say that a noun out of place or the word used even subtly in the wrong way can change the meaning in a big way. Now, maybe his struggles with the language are, are yeah, but I think he's doing all right with it. So that's very impressive on Edwards's part. Um, and just on Galtier, while you're, while you're doing this for anyone who's watching as opposed to just listening on the radio, I'm throwing up the famous image of your last game in 03, because it was Galtier who came over and gave you a big hug, wasn't it? You know him. Well, it was. Well. I, I do. I know him very well. Yeah. And um, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's a quality guy. Um, he also surrounded himself with other quality guys. Ibanez, who was French captain. So you've, you've had two very successful French captains that are very different guys, actually, um, uh, working together on it. Um, and I, I mentioned again before, but... Um, I think it was the biggest contract I was offered was two years after I'd retired and what he'd wanted. So this is in 2005, I think 2006. What he wanted was a captain to finish the matches. I still haven't yet to see that really happen. He wanted a player to sit in the bench who was an international captain to play for 20 minutes to think clearly at the end of the game. How much money? Was me, I don't know. Uh, a lot of money. Um, <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't mention money, Joe. Um, you said it was a massive it, contract. Uh, it was a massive contract, and um, but it was to do it for six months. Right. So for 20 minutes, for six months. They just, because he said, we kind of lose our way at the end of games. Where, so was, he, like where, where was he at that stage, clear. Pete, sorry? Stade, Stade, Stade Francais. Okay. And um, so he's been coaching since then, right? So he retired the, uh, he retired the week after me. Um, and that was the comment when we were hugging. It was either him or, or I on that day. Whoever whoever lost that game retired. So he lasted a week longer than me. But but he is he's a smart guy. He is clued into it. Uh, politics, uh, rugby, and politics are totally um, intertwined in France. Um, they had a big vote that they never wanted to have a non-French coach for the French rugby team. That was a big thing among all the clubs in the last while. Um, but they still manoeuvred to get a, a, um, a Wigan boy in to, to help with the defence. So they've, um, they've manoeuvred whatever they've had to do. And look, I think it augurs well for the game because they play differently. That's, and that's the point for me. We don't want the same all the time. We want little bits of different. It's a shrewd move getting Edwards in. It already looks that way. Matt, you're obviously in France at the moment. Are they cock a hoop with all this? The uh, Midi Olympic, which is the uh, rugby newspaper that comes out twice a week right across France, has five pages <laughs> on the game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're loving it. They're loving that uh, um, on a whole lot of fronts. The, 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 the fact it is a young French side that uh, they're playing with great expression and, and courage and effort. Uh, and they, you know, despite all this, uh, you know, the talk about French attack, they're loving the D. They're loving the com physical commitment, the courage, how they put their bodies on the line. And, and they kept a, a great team out, you know. And, and as Keith said, it took a piece, two pieces of staggering individual, individual brilliance from Johnny May to break, to break the line. So... Yeah, they're, they're really happy. I mean, no, we've got to keep it in context. The last 20 minutes, the scrum and the line-out more than creaked. Um, they, they were in a, a bit of trouble there. But um, to, to get a win like that against against England, is, it's just massive. I think it's a year too early for this French side. I think we'll see a lot of a lot of improvement in this French side over the next 12 months. And next year's Six Nations, I think they could be a really, yeah. a real handful. Matt, can I, but can, it, was, it was great to watch, yeah. really great to watch. Can I ask you, so, uh, on England, uh, Jones uh, is certainly accused of being an odd selector at times. Keith mentioned the back row, for instance. Uh, so there's that. But if, if we think back to 2018 when things were going very well for Irish rugby and Jones and England were at a real low ebb, that was the period where they didn't have Tuolagi and they didn't have Billy Vinopola and I think they lost Mako Vinopola uh, for a good chunk of that uh, Six Nations as well. I'm going to correction on that point, but I think, I think effectively the two Vinopolas were gone and Tuolagi was gone as well. So 
with England, I mean, are they actually just a bit one-dimensional? You know what I mean? You, you, you take away that heft that transforms any side. W what's actually left with England for all these really high, highly ranked players and this brilliant World Cup behind them, Matt? Uh, Joe, it's a very good question. I, I would delve firstly into the psychology of English sport. And, and Keith played at Harlequins for many years, and we've had a couple of chats about the English psychology coming to Ireland. But I just see it time and time and time again right across English sport that when they get some success, they, they talk themselves up like you wouldn't believe. Like What Eddie said last week was appalling. And I, I got great respect. I mean, I joke about Eddie because I've been a competitor against him for many years. But, I, you know, I have great respect. He's, he's, he's made two World Cup finals. You know, he's won, won Super Rugby. Like he, he, the guys don't do that if you're, if you're a mug. He, and he survived 25 years. He's, he's phenomenal. But what he said last week was absolutely outrageous. But the English media didn't come out and say, oh, it's outrageous. The players didn't say, that's outrageous. They lapped it up. But that's when English teams fail. They talk it up publicly. You can talk it up inside your change room when no one's listening. Say, listen, boys, we want to win this World Cup. We're going to win it. But once you get out and you start pumping your own tyres up in public, the opposition get cross. And all it does is empower your opponents. And that's exactly what they did. And then things went wrong. It put pressure on the players. I've never seen Owen Farrell drop a ball twice in a game. And that's what happened. I thought his selections were wrong. Now, he got his selection wrong. We, we took with this joke for the final uh, of the World Cup. And we spoke about this. The uh, guy called Ben Darwin, who's a former Wallaby uh, tight head prop, um, didn't play a lot, but played a number of games for, for Australia, said that Eddie Jones, you know, by putting, by putting Courtney Laws at tight head second row, really depowered that side of, of the uh, English scrum in the final. We remember Coles getting popped uh, up in the air after uh, the injury to, to Kyle Sinclair there early in the, in the final. Now, Ben Darwin said that he did it in 2005 at Twickenham when he was coaching Australia because he was in that game and, uh, and the, the, he was on the bench, I believe, and, and the tight head prop at the time. Al Baxter copped all this, this uh, criticism, but it was the actual, they put a bad, a loose head second row over behind the tight head who couldn't scrummage on that side. So, look, none of us are perfect in this selection. Sure. When you get it right, you're a hero, and when you don't, you're a mug. But England, when they start bragging, start doing this, it affects them. Now, they've got to go back to do what they do well. They, they can't put... Curry, who, you know, depowered de Curry by putting him at eight. He was at a phenomenal World Cup. So you take a guy out of the position where he was, he was almost the best in the world during that World Cup, and you put him in a different position. Why do that? Mm. So it is bad selecting, but it's, it's also bad team culture. You just feel you're not respecting your opponent enough. Now, I, I think this might be interesting to see what the selection is this week and whether they get themselves grounded when they're going up to, to Murrayfield. Because two years ago, they did the same thing. Eddie started bragging, I'm only going to put one guy on the ruck. We only did, I've seen the modern way and run. First guy to come in, pushed him out of the way and stole about six, six rucks. Yeah. Game over. Yeah. So, you know, they've they, they got form in this, uh, in this area. OK. Fellas, we're out of time. Looking forward to the weekend. Thanks so much. Keith Wood, Matt Williams. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Pleasure, Joe. Pleasure, Pleasure, Keith. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.